Hello, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome. Here we are once again. Your Wednesday night webinar on no CD. Let me get that all set up. Oh, look at that. It looks lovely. Looks a little crookedy, actually. I don't know why that is, but it's all right. We'll live with that. <laughs> For those of you who have a symmetry issue, you may not like it, but we'll deal with it. <laughs> Uh, John uh, should be here. He was having an audio issue. He was on and uh, popped off. Uh, says that he may have figured out the problem. Oh, yes. The computer update going on. So he, he should be on in a couple of minutes. Uh, let me just message him back and say, yes. Yes, John. That is likely it. My head. Okay, so John will be here. Uh, so we'll get started. Kazanish says, "Does commenting now count, given that it isn't live yet?" Yes, uh, you can. You can comment on this at any time, and uh, we'll be there. We'll be able to see it. Uh, hello, thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you, uh, Awais. I hope I said that right. Is is it? Iris wrote a lot, so I'm going to kind of summarize here, which is basically the idea that uh, suffering from OCD, you have a girlfriend, all your intrusive thoughts around her. You say that um, you have lots of intrusive images and things that are difficult. And the, uh, even though it makes no sense, you know, and it leads you to feeling guilty, you undo the thoughts all day by neutralizing the thought, by consciously engaging in, in thinking of other things. And then you've tried to do nothing, but that leads to a panic and a fear that something bad happens. So you say, so I must neutralize the thought and do a compulsion. Otherwise, I will never feel good and bad things will start happening. And that's how your days go. And you say, you know, it's not true, but at the same time, why, why, why can't I do anything about it? Why can't I just live my life? I'm sorry for the long message. Also suggest some ERPs. I don't know that I might try. Well, here's what I'll say. As long as you give in to compulsions, uh, there's, there's not going to be anything else that I'm going to suggest to you other than allow yourself to be uncomfortable. Now you'll say, I can't. And I'll say, you won't, is what I'll say. I believe that you can. I don't believe that you can't. It may be very uncomfortable. I accept that. I hear that. I get that. But keep this in mind. OCD knows what you've set up for your limit of uncomfortable is, and it will cross that line to get you to do a compulsion. So if you say I'll handle everything up until a 9.7, OCD will take everything to a 9.8 and then you will do a compulsion. That is just the way it works. That is how it goes. I can't make it any simpler in a description than that. That is exactly what is going to happen. OCD will always take it beyond the line that you set that you're willing to deal with, which means we have to decide I'm willing to deal with anything that OCD hands to me, no matter what the intrusive thought or the intrusive image or the intrusive urge might be, because I'm not going to allow OCD to run my life anymore. Now, I know it sucks to hear that, and I wish I had better news for you. I wish that I could say, you know what? OCD does have a limit, and as long as you recognize that, then things will be okay. But guess what? OCD has no limit. OCD will take it anywhere that it can possibly go. So if, if you think, well, I have to do this compulsion because that's what's going to prevent something bad from happening and I can't handle it otherwise, OCD wins. No one yet has figured out how to overcome OCD by doing more compulsions. We, we haven't figured that out yet. Let's, let's see if uh, Dr. Grayson is here with us now. We see you. Hi there. We hear you. you hear oh, yes. John Grayson. Yes, I switched to my iPad. 
Welcome back. Yes. The ultimate backup. Yes. <laughs> Good to have you with us. I have such a computer. It's really true. Oh, and now we've we've kind of lost you on the iPad. Oh, there we go. It's a better. All right. right. We'll let you get that set up, and there we go. Mm -hmm. And let's okay. see if we get John. All right. Very good. Um, I went through Iris's question already about, you know, I talked about the idea that OCD has no limit. So if you've said mm -hmm. I can handle anything up to a 9.7, OCD will take it to a 9.8 and then you'll do the compulsion and OCD's happy you did the compulsion. And, and as long as you've set up a line that says I can't handle anything more than this, OCD knows that it will take it to that. Yes, yes. Another way to put it is for every logical answer, there's another question. And of course. Uh, every every what-if question that's given a logical answer will be followed by a yeah, but what-if question. Uh, yes, in, yeah. In that kind of mm -hmm. So. Uh, All right. I'm going to have to let you uh, be in charge see. of questions because of my iPad. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't really allow – it doesn't give me enough room. Which oh, is bizarre okay. to see the questions. Yeah. Uh, happy to read them off then. So <laughs> my therapists have recommended me to let my intrusive thoughts and images come and go and that I should try doing this in life and not only sit home and do ERPs. Absolutely. You're finding this difficult. Your question is, will it be helpful or should I sit down and purposely expose myself to thoughts and images and will that help me faster? Uh, I love people. You have to do this in life. It isn't just sitting down. You know, sometimes I think people take us literally when we say sit with the thoughts. Well, okay, I have to go sit down now and I have to be with the thought while I'm sitting down. It, it, doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be sitting down. It should be living your life with OCD. So how do, you, how do you learn to live with OCD, not just sit with OCD? But OCD does love literal. My, my favorite literal interpretation of OCD, John, was uh, someone said to me once, my priest told me I should start off every day with a prayer. So they set their alarm for 11.59 p.m. so they could be up at midnight saying prayers when it turned midnight because, of course, that's, the day, right. that, that's when the day starts is, is at that point. Mm -hmm. so, yes. I love watching you make your tea. And, you know, and their big it's mistake was he meant when it starts in Rome. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Right. It was the wrong time. So, the wrong time, yes. That's the only right time. It's the Roman time, yes. Uh, question to you, John. Dear Dr. Grayson, for mental obsessions and compulsions, can you elaborate on the concept of the exposure being to treat the obsessions as if they're OCD? Sure. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm always trying to find ways to be uncertain. Yes. And, and so I, I think there might be two parts to the exposure when we're talking about it. Part one is like, if the worst thing happens, here's what it's going to look like for me. You know, and, 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 if, and, and if it, here's what it looks like for me. And here's how I would attempt to cope with it in a positive way. You know, so if I'm worried about being a pedophile and I actually diddle a kid, how am I going to try to cope with that afterwards? Killing yourself is not acceptable. Like, how am I going to try to make the best of that? Uh, so I'm always endeavoring to do that. Meanwhile, in terms of how I'm going to live my life, you know, um, what I what, the, what that person described is kind of the guideline I'm using. I'm going to, you know, so I'm living my life as if it's OCD uh, and acknowledging I might be wrong, you know. So I'm not going to I'm not going to avoid going someplace because maybe my OCD is a reflection of a horrible reality. I'm going to act like it's OCD and acknowledge like, well, I hope that's the case, but I'm going to, I'm going to, so I'm going to make the decisions this way and I'll wait until I discover for sure without making any effort that it's, you know, not OCD, you know, like if I think my thoughts can kill people when I've killed three people on three separate occasions, I'll decide, okay, 
this has gone beyond coincidence. I really have this power. Until then, I'm going to go around and potentially do exposures where it's going like, okay, I'll kill this person, kill that person, and and so on, if that's coherent. How many people do you think you've wished to die in your career, John? <laughs> Just out of curiosity. <laughs> well, without going into names. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For, for political reasons. Yes, always a good call. Uh, <laughs> but I had two peop- two different people who were afraid of, you know, that they maybe have witchcraft powers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, often when, you know, you and I, we engage in a witch ritual for per- somebody, you know, we often yes. have them like focusing on a family member. Of course. Mm-hmm. You know, which terrifies them. But, you know, in a way, you could always wonder about the validity of that because, you know, it's like part of them doesn't think they want the family member killed. So uh, I, 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 in the last couple of years, had one where uh, the direct the, the witchcraft uh, to kill someone was directed at somebody with that, you know, they kind of wanted dead. Mm-hmm. And I pointed out that, you know, we, we made some rules, like it has to, you know, work within a week. And, um, you know, and, and if it does work, we don't really get to know if, you know, they did it, I did it, we did it, or coincidence. Right. I was a li- I, 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 this is a terrible admission of my imperfection, but I'm, I'm willing to go there. I, I kind of was a little disappointed it didn't work. Mm-hmm. But it didn't. So, um, yes. I don't know if I answered your question with that story. I mean, I think it, it's, it's got to be in the hundreds of thousands at this point with the amount of examples I do where I have oh. rooms full of people wish for the ceiling to fall and collapse upon us and take us all out. So mm-hmm. I've, I've got to be in the tens of thousands, maybe the hundreds of thousands at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, the best we can say, you know, I, I once had a client who came to me with that problem. They thought their thoughts could kill people. And, and uh, you know, there've been a lot of therapists who told them that wasn't true. And my response to them was, well, maybe you can kill people, but we know you don't have a high hit rate. Yeah. Because they hadn't killed anyone mm-hmm. to date. Yeah. I think that's the best any of us can get. You know, I, I need to see a repeated hit rate, not a one shot. I need to see you do it a couple right. of times to begin to go like, okay, this doesn't look good. Let's call the CIA because they can use you. Right. I mean, the OCD loves a coincidence, but we don't we don't see that. Well, as I like lo- lo- you know I do it baby. scientifically. You know, more, you, you got to have more than once. Yeah, you know, and more than once means like you know, if you kill a busload of people in one shot, that's still one. You know, mm-hmm. got to be three separate occasions. Yeah. Brayden asks, is it okay to work with an OCD therapist while also reading and applying new techniques and tips from OCD books and podcasts? If so, what books do you guys recommend? If you don't want to overcomplicate or try too many OCD therapies at once, lastly, what's a good approach to contamination OCD uh, that is about illegal substances, for example, worried about being around it on you in your food? All right, we can get to that. What kind of, uh, what well, kind of illegal substances did they say? Uh, they just said illegal substances, for example, worried about being around them or on you or in your food. So I'm assuming drugs at, at, that, at that. But we can go with arsenic. Because people's idea of illegal, yeah. you know, there is as to yeah. what they mean by illegal. You know, they're talking yeah. heroin, they're talking about house cleaner. Um, right. Yeah. I, I think if I'm working with a competent OC therapist, I kind of prefer that if the individual tells me they're reading something to check with me because, you know, it's not, I, I know you know that I'm not really an opinionated person. Uh, no, you've, I've never heard an opinion yeah. from you, actually. So. Yeah. So um, I, I want to know what they're reading to see if I agree with that person or not, you know. And um, so if reading is going to cause conflict for them, it's like, but they say this and they say this and you're saying that, it's like, well, you're seeing me, so let's try listening to me. If it's a book that agrees with me, then it's great. Yeah. Um, so, so I feel like the second part of the question, what are some good books? Well, I mean, I'd rather be starting with, if, if we think you have a competent OC therapist, then, you know, I, I'd be going, I'd, I'd be asking their advice because you can get them you know, there's a lot of places where all the books agree, but you can get some contradictory advice. And um, 
So, so yeah, I, I would not automatically be pursuing other things, uh, or, or at least checking, well, not checking with them. I might ask them and let the therapist decide, okay, you're trying to do the perfect treatment and you're just like checking, you know, get, trying to get a group like agreement on what we're doing. And so like, yep, we're not doing that. Yes, you want to know if it's for reassurance purposes or not, you know. Yeah. As long as all the therapists say the same thing, then maybe it's true. Oh, but this one said something slightly different. So now I Yeah, have to and they do say so, you know. Yeah. I, I have had some people come to me in a session and tell me I'm contradicting my book. You yeah. know. Sometimes they're I, usually they're wrong, but every now and then it's like, Yeah, I know I said that there, but you know, this is for you. Yeah. And um you know, so yes, I, I, you're right. This is not what the book, this is not what the book said. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Brett Deacon once said, uh, everybody who's written a treatment manual doesn't fully follow their own treatment manual that they've written a hundred percent. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to. Uh, OCD is full of shit. Okay. That's good. I like that. That's a fun comment. Yeah. We, I think we'd agree with that. Um, uh, oh, and the other piece was illegal substances. Yeah. Uh, boy, I mean, I've treated people who thought, uh, I can't, I can't have a salt shaker at my house because what if it's full of uh, poison or something of that nature, right? You've had, I, ju I, I'm always mildly poisoning everything. Yes. For people, you know, with people with, you know, I have a, can of raid when people touch the end where it sprays out and then we'll rub it on all the coffee cups in my office before they you know go home and rub it on all the stuff and you know hmm. they're tight you know there's a question of the right quantity and you know so i hope i'm making the right guess right yeah uh, i haven't lost anybody yet so i have a low hit rate for death sure yeah i mean we've shared gum and water together so we haven't killed each other in doing that but uh yeah, it could not happen. For lack of trying. So not right, for lack exactly. of trying. Hundred <laughs> <100%. laughs> uh, percent. Advice for when anxiety is provoked by toxic people in the family or in the work environment. Well, uh, mm. uh, you know, any anything or anyone can be a trigger. So first of all, keep that in mind. Uh, and the person who's a trigger to you may be loved by everybody else. That which could be as well too. So. There's a perception experience that comes along with that. So I, I would even say that because it doesn't even just have to be toxic people. It could be anybody could be a trigger. You, you may perceive them that way, but it doesn't mean that anybody else does. Ha, uh, how do, how do you deal with that? Well, I'm going to go back to my favorite exposure and response prevention type of therapy. You never have to like the person, but you also don't have to let them have a massive influence on your life either. And I think to add to that, you know, if, if we're going to say, you know, in a clinical way, we agree this is a really toxic individual in your life that you're stuck with. Part of therapy is not, it's like part of the therapy to cope with the OCD is part of, you know, it's kind of separate. It's like, how are you going to cope in a better way with this toxic person? Because uh, there are some techniques I can use to cope with their toxicity that have nothing to do with OCD. I mean, there could be the situation where the two are combined. You know, my OCD is focused on their toxicity. That's a complicated problem and I have to treat both. Or it could be, right, like I have contamination, but this person's toxicity just triggers me, which would also happen, in which case, you know, it, it's an additional part of treatment. It's like, yes, you live with this awful person who's treating you this way. Let's talk about but they're not aversive, but how are we going to help you limit your response to them, you know, so that they don't need control, you know, and, and there are a couple of different tricks that would require me or, or Patrick to, you know, talk to you for one to three hours to get an idea of the nature of the toxicity of them and what we think uh, their pathology is and what a useful way for you to cope with it is. Right. I mean, I'm assuming. Yeah, I was I was yeah. reading ahead to see uh, what we were. Oh, OK, to do next OK. Time. But I no, I, I agree with you. Um, 
There are self-compassion practices that involve breathing or touching or noticing the environment after an exposure has been made, not with the idea of reducing anxiety or gaining reassurance, but to support ourselves during this difficult time. Is this compulsive for you? It could be. I would I would say OCD can make anything into a compulsion. So that is what we always have to be aware of. What are you getting out of the experience? And if you were in a situation, you weren't able to do that, and that would lead you to be amazingly anxious because you couldn't do it, sounds like it's leaning on the compulsive for me. Right. Self-compassion doesn't always mean it feels good. Right. Mm -hmm. Self-compassion... Self-compassion can be like going to the dentist. You know, <laughs> it's good for me. I'm making myself do it and it sucks. So, so it's, you know, sometimes self-compassion, you know, it's, it's one reason I like Kimberly Quinlan's book because, you know, it's not flowers and unicorns. It's like, you know, self-compassion mm -hmm. is learning to be nice to myself, but it's not, it doesn't make everything great. It's like, you know, it also can be the work. So, um, Yes, are you doing this compulsively to try to feel better? Or are you doing it as part of making the exposure more complete? And... Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's hard, you know, especially even for new therapists who are coming into the field, the notion that the work we do isn't designed to make people feel better in the short run in the short run yeah mm -hmm. exactly yeah it it That's, is designed yeah. to make you feel better but just like a surgery is not designed to make you feel better in the short run but it can definitely make you feel better in the long term right yeah physical yeah. therapy yeah. doesn't feel great in the short term but it mm -hmm. can help you in the long run yeah and, and the self-compassion practices they mentioned and because it's out of context in some sense, I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, I would agree. You know, like I under, I have a certain set of times I might be suggesting stuff like that, but just to say it in a very general way, uh, it wouldn't occur to me because because it, because it, it needs it would need to be more specific to the situation. So I I don't know what their sources what their sources or what they're working on it for. Or why 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 in what way is this self compassion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jack says, after becoming aware of my thought process, I started obsessing with how thoughts are produced automatically, etc. I concluded that since I can't consciously produce thoughts, then it means I can't think. This belief has been troubling me for three years now. No amount of reassurance, logic, or, or researching has helped me shake it off. I can't help it but to feel inferior to everyone else since I feel broken. I have tried to stop trying to figure it out, but it's so hard. I get overwhelmed by the constant stream of negative thoughts and feelings. Well, in, in listening to what you're saying, I can hear the mistakes that you're making. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and the one thing I, I the one thing I think it's always amazing about OCD. I think it's an incredibly philosophical disorder. People ask all the great questions of philosophy. What is the nature of the mind? What is the nature of God? How do, what is the nature of good and evil? How do I live happily in a world where me or my family can die at any time? And there is only one difference between OCD sufferers and great philosophers. People with OCD actually want an answer, <laughs> you know, because you, know, you think there's some college professor who spends his entire career studying the work of a single philosopher because that guy's answers to the nature of life are so complicated. It takes a lifetime to understand what he's saying. So on one hand, this is an incredible, this question that is being raised is a question that philosophers and and all kinds of people who focus on the mind you know focus on like you know where our thoughts produced and what's automatic and it's cut you know it, it's the knowledge where, where's the knowledge of the thought come in and all those things and um i i think the mistake this person is making is they've actually eradicated uncertainty mm -hmm. in a way that i don't think is justifiable 
Right. They said, well, I can't think. Given mm -hmm. that nobody can really describe what the nature of thinking is, I don't know that you can think or not because all of us are in the same boat as you. And just because there are all these other people walking around going like, no, I know how to think. That doesn't mean they're right. You know, if I, if I ask somebody, how do you know you love your spouse? You know, and, 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 and you, and they'll give you an answer and say, well, how do you know that's the correct answer? And pretty much any answer they give is inadequate. And usually if you get a person without OCD at some point, they'll say, I just know. I just know that in that way is code for, I don't really have any idea. I feel like it's true. I choose to believe it, so shut up. Just because I choose to believe it doesn't mean I'm right. So I feel like I think pretty well, but this might just be all automatic and I just think and I'm responding to a really complex set of automatic stimuli and don't really know what I'm doing. It just feels that way. So. In the same way, I don't know if I'm in reality or if I'm making everything up. And this is all a stimulation. I am reasonably confident that I have no way of figuring out whether it's a stimulation or not. So going back to the very beginning where somebody asked that question, I'm gonna act like I'm actually here until I figure out for sure I'm not. I'm gonna act like I'm thinking. I don't have to actually know. So his assumption, that I don't know how to think, actually, you're going for certainty. You're not really going for uncertainty. The answer is, yeah, I don't actually know. Maybe, you know, it's like all I get to know is people don't seem to think I'm an idiot. So whatever automatic things are coming out of my mouth seem to work. You know, and so I would be answering the negativity, not with positive, like, oh, you know, you're thinking is all good. It's like, well, I don't get to know, but apparently I'm getting away with it. And I have no reason to believe that I'm in fear to anyone else, because if, 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 if my conclusions are correct, they're true for everybody. Nobody knows how to think, because I, I could make that argument that it's, you know, it's all stimulus response, and it's a very complex set of stimuli that, that give us the appearance that all this interaction is spontaneous and, you know, working as opposed to, all right, as opposed to automatic. So, you know, I, I think he's, Work, he, he's, he's, he's falsely assumed certainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I like not it. think, but I do, I, you know, I'm like, yeah, I've been pretty lucky with the automatic stuff coming out of my mouth. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've always liked to point out, I'll, I'll go along that line. OCD loves words like can't. Uh, just such huge, huge fan of the word can't, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's in the arsenal of OCD along with must and should and ought and have to and need these, these all or nothing words, you know, I can or can't think I can or can't do this. I, uh, my, my favorite example was someone once came in my office and said, I can't get on an elevator. So we walked to the elevator. I pushed the button. I said, I'd like to watch you bounce off the mm -hmm. invisible force field that stops you from entering like the elevator. One, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and they looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, well, I know you can walk and you've walked in and out of doorways to get in the building in my office. You've proven you, you know how to do everything necessary to get on an elevator. There's only one reason why you can't. It, a force field will block you and watching yeah. you bounce or off alternatively you're trying to say <clears throat> it's really scary for you and you don't and want to and that <coughs> and it. that doesn't sound as good right but until 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 i see you bounce off i'm leaning for that one yes yes it's, um yes you know i i i would say every everything i feel like i know is a guess Mm -hmm. I think some things are low probability or high probability. The low probability events happen. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't know the nat I don't know the nature of what we call thinking. If it's actually thinking the way that we would prefer to think about it, mm -hmm. but I can't do anything about that. I don't. You could also. So I, I give up on knowing. Right. Because you could it's go a low up to probability that I, it's a low probability sure. I will know the answer with certainty. There you go. There you go. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. It's the yeah. You could go up to people on the street and ask them what they think about thinking, and ninety nine percent would say, I, "I don't know. I don't. 
and nor do I care. Right. Uh, right. 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 So what cares about these minuscule things OCD does and tells mm. you they've become the most important thing in the world and they must be solved in order to be able to do anything else. And again, just to beat a dead horse. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. He, he hasn't done exposure because he's actually decided with yeah. certainty that he can't do this and then beats himself up. And, um, you know, from a philosophical point of view, depending on which philosopher I go with, his assumption he doesn't really think is quite accurate. It's just that it applies to everybody. Now, I, I suppose there's an incredibly slim chance he's different than everyone else. And you and I think, and he doesn't. That seems lower probability. It seems more likely you and I trick ourselves into, you know, the comfort of believing we're thinking. And um, he doesn't. You know, it's kind of like religion. Give me two really devout people. Oh, two yeah. very different religions. Mm -hmm. Technically, at least one of them is wrong. Yes. But they both believe fully. So me thinking I believe something and believing with all my heart is true. It's a very comfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think if it's not screwing up your life, you might as well go with it. Mm -hmm. But it's not proof. Mm -mm. Yeah. I feel like I love my wife. I feel certain about that. If somebody says, like, could you be tricking yourself? And the answer is like, yeah. But yeah, since we've been married for more than 50 years and we're not killing each other and everything, I'm going to go along with this idea, even if it's an illusion. Yeah. It's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, if I suddenly wake up and go like, oh my God. <laughs> what have I this. done? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That could happen. <laughs> low probability event that's all i can say yeah yeah it could happen but, okay james says wanted to ask about uh, something i'm going on vacation in a few hours and i'm constantly checking my bag to make sure all my medications are in there what's good erp well we would say <laughs> not checking anymore is fantastically good erp <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's more I, I get, obviously well no you know no no you know Patrick I, I, I'm not sure there's more I mean well the only more I can add is I, I would add only one other thing mm -hmm. I'm going to add something I'm thinking it might be different okay I, 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 would, I would I would go on I, I will say this I would add you're you're going to work toward a goal which is to accept the doubt that OCD says is unacceptable. <laughs> and I would, I would work with also, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to take the risk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hope I've checked and I'm going to hope it's there. And if it's not there, I'm going to try to cope. And a few things will be true. Mm -hmm. One, depending where he's going, he may or may not be able to get more meds, you know, if he can, of course, that's what I'll try to do. If he's for some reason going to some place where he can't, then it'd be like, okay, I might at some point during the vacation have a really crappy time because OCD is going to be much harder to work with. Mm -hmm. It's going to attack me. And the reason I'm going to take that risk because it's better for me to take that risk than to give into my OCD. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd be thinking about the worst disaster. Yes, I. you know what? This vacation might suck. It might be an expensive, fabulous vacation that's going to suck. I feel like if you're checking your meds this much, you might have a sucky vacation with or without meds because, you know, it seems like you're letting OCD already take control. So... I'd be taking the risk and I'd be going through, okay, you know, how am I going to try to do exposure if I'm having the biological extra pressure where my OCD is much stronger and I'm feeling depressed and how am I going to make the best of that circumstance? Because it's, it's always the same when we talk about living with uncertainty. What's the worst that can happen? How will I attempt to cope with it? And it's second best. I'm not, you know, like, yeah, 
I, it'd be way better not to get your meds. Um, but it's equally way better to not get out of hand before your vacation. You know, and, and I do think this individual, and we see this a lot, you know, you see people in a certain situation, it's like, I'm doing this special thing. I don't want OCD to interfere, which, you know, I know I can see from the little curl of a smile on your face. It's like, yeah, that means it's going to. And so you are picking one way that OCD might, you know, that my, things might screw up if I don't have my meds. I think it's possibly really likely, not a guarantee that if you could suddenly get sure about your meds, you're going to think about some other way the medication is going to get screwed up. You know, what else will ruin this really wonderful time? So your job is to, to notice whatever you enjoy on the vacation. And I, when I say enjoy, I don't mean necessarily the way you should enjoy it. Like, you know, I'm getting 80% out of it. If you enjoy something just 5%, I want you to notice that. You know, so you forget your meds. It'll suck a lot of it, but there'll be little parts. And we want you to practice noticing them because often people only focus on what they're not getting. And so, you know, the beginning of mindfulness is noticing everything. So, yes, it sucks. And, well, yeah, I did kind of like that a little bit. And if you like it a lot, cool. I want you to notice that too. That That is the what you can plan to do if the disaster occurs. Yep. So you have a whole airplane ride of not looking at your meds and thinking about that. Let's see. The longer I starve compulsions, the less anxiety I feel over intrusive thoughts, which is great. Until anxiety kicks in over the lack of anxiety, which we hear. Advice for overcoming this stumbling block. Well, presumably, I'm, I'm hearing one of two things. You know, some people, you know, if it's like violent thoughts, people get upset about not feeling anxious about the violent thought because maybe I really am now a killer because I don't care about right. killing. Those darn therapists made me not care so much about that, which means they've turned me into a murderer. <laughs> yeah. So so the exposure would be like, well, you know, maybe that's true. I'm going to, again, I'm going to, I'm going to hope this is an OC thought and that I don't do X, but you know, maybe I will and I'll have to cope with that. Mm -hmm. Or they're focusing simply on the, the, the anxiety they're feeling is separate from any thoughts. They just really are trying to avoid anxiety because it's kind of a set, you know, because it's kind of a separate consequence from them besides the intrusive thought. In which case, and I don't know that we can really go into it here, in which case, you know, there would be a bunch of techniques that we would be recommending not to get rid of the anxiety, but to learn to cope with the anxiety differently. So, um, that's doable, you know, so it depends which of those two things you're talking about, you know, or you could be talking about both, but um, luckily, you know, I am sure you are a unique person and luckily the special things about you are not this thing, the thing you've described. This is common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about you, John, but I, I still have no anxiety about my drive the other night in the rain when I hit some potholes. I, I'm still not going to go back to see if I might have run anybody over. Yeah, but you're 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 a horrible person. So true. So that's maybe yeah. that's why. Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah. This is so, true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, we know I'm a horrible person. I was disappointed my witchcraft didn't work. Exactly. Exactly. I'm still sad when I offered to auction my soul off to the highest bidder. No one showed up at the end of the of this <laughs> webinar year, a year ago. I was very mm -hmm. disappointed. Proving I am the soulless bastard that John Grayson tells me I am every time mm -hmm. I see him. <laughs> With no soul to sell, who's going to bid? Exactly. There's no bidders that show up. Michelle says, do you have any advice on how to approach a family member with OCD who is unwilling to seek therapy or doesn't think they need help? We have a lot yeah. of advice on this one. Well, you know, I feel like I have two answers. Yeah, I do too. And I'm going to let you take it over in a second. But 
I mean, that is, you know, first of all, that is always the hardest question. Yeah. And, and it's a question that the odds of me coming up with an answer that's simple enough to help somebody do that are slim. Right. Cause, cause I think, I think when we're in that situation, um, there are a bunch of different things that we're going to suggest to people in that situation. Um, and not all of our suggestions are the ones you would want to hear, you know, because, because right. among the, you know, because I can't guarantee that the outcome is going to be the person's going to do therapy, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it's, uh, you know, it depends, you know, it, it depends. Is it a spouse? Is it a kid, an older kid, a younger kid? brother or sister and you know and there's certain places where you might technically be helpless and there are other situations where there might be things for you to do but that might you know that might help you not that individual so although we maybe start with trying to help the individual it can't be guaranteed that we will be able to help that individual right yeah i and and by the way, this is one of the things that we do at NoCD. We do what we call our NoCD 411 sessions. So if anybody's mm -hmm. looking for something like that, reach out to us at NoCD.com and we'd be happy to set something like this up. I know our friends at the St. Louis Behavioral Medicine Institute are very good at this and do a lot of this work as well, too. And I'm sure you they, get pulled aside at every IOCDF conference about yeah. this kind of question. Well, you know, I have my strategic pressure. I think I say our friends at St. Louis, Alec and some some of his friends are going to be coming out with a new book yep. about this. And um, they've told us really that for 10 years though. So we'll see. When oh, no, I've seen, I've seen a copy of the book. <gasps> no. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and it was really, but it's not a, it's mm -hmm. not like a how to for families, mm -hmm. but it is a, it really helps families understand. Mm -hmm. So, so I did do a terrible thing that, you know, I'm acting like I'm telling a secret here now that I'm spreading it to the world. I did have this one family who had trouble understanding this very difficult, you know, individual in their family. And I gave them a PDF of the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one sale down he's not getting. Yeah, right. Um, but they found it really helpful. You know, again, but it wasn't that it changed it. It wasn't like they now know how to do it. But it was a certain comfort in understanding things a lot better. Um, so, so I assume since I read a pre-press thing and you know, that is coming out within a couple of months or so. Yeah. Well, but, he but likes was, you better than me because he didn't send me one. So that's cool. <laughs> that's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you really walked into that. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I totally did. I set that up perfectly. Yeah. So that was good. Yeah. yeah. Um, Michelle, the other piece too, and I've, I've said this to families, like you, you have to decide how many times you're going to play fool me once, fool me twice. Uh, and, and are you, are you on the fool me 758th time where I'm really hoping this was the time I would have said or done something and OCD would have said, Oh, okay. They're, they're actually legit people. It's all good. And we should listen to them and follow their advice. No, uh, I, I really do push families to start living the life that they want to live and not the life of accommodations that OCD demands out of this. And uh, th just know that the household could become uncomfortable for a while, but it's already uncomfortable, which is already the thing. No one, no one has ever said to me they live very comfortably with OCD in the home. So do you want to live supporting OCD, making it worse over time? Or do you want to live in such a way that you're going to put some guardrails on what OCD does and then slowly try to try to squeeze it out of the household? Now, that won't be fun. No. And people reach out to John and I all the time. Is, is there an easier answer than that? No. We, we haven't figured it out yet. Uh, let's see. I feel like my OCD waxes and wanes, but the more I tune into my thoughts, the more challenging it become to do ER or becomes to do ERP, like living by my values. I find it hard to do just what I need to do. 
because uh, you know what there's this is easier to put on here sorry it's a mm -hmm. little back and forth from our friend terracotta ciabatta i'll let you read that all everybody i find it hard to just do what i need to do because well I have to rhyme every time I know I'm about to do something. I like the rhyme every time. There is a, mm -hmm. it felt like a yeah. line. Uh, I value. So how can I pull myself out of this and mess it up so I can treat rhyming as just a mild annoyance and accept it and move on? Well, of course, if you I, I, make a rhyme, you could then undo it by saying a non-rhyme and then do something you value and start there. Mm -hmm. it, it sounded like I read that last part of can I just kind of ritualize and then be okay with it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, the only thing confusing about what she's saying is there's an implication that somehow rhyme, not rhyming goes against her values. As I'm reading, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how, I'm not, I'm not sure where the values came in there. Do were you, were you clear? You know, Let's so um, just that if she doesn't do something she values with without a, if she does something she values without a rhyme, then something. Ooh, ooh. I want to go back to something you said and say it differently. OK, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I want to know that if I had that, that if, first I'd want to know, does she have anybody in her life that she loves dearly? You know, kid, husband right. or anything. And I want to know that if I have a gun aimed at that kid and say, if you rhyme, and you know we have the mind reading machine, so if you rhyme, I'm blowing your kid's leg off. Are you going to rhyme? I have the feeling that she'll probably say, well, no, I wouldn't do it then. At which point I say, oh, so you don't have to rhyme every time. Now let's give you another situation. I'm going to tell you to hold your breath for three minutes. And if you don't hold your breath for three minutes, I'm going to shoot your kid in the leg. What's going to happen? And probably you can't hold your breath for, maybe if you make it 15, probably can't hold your breath for 15 minutes, probably. So they're probably getting shot. So I, I believe that it's likely you have to breathe. They have to rhyme really translates to, it feels horribly uncomfortable to me to do that. It's still a choice. I don't mean an easy like choice like chocolate and vanilla, but a choice of like, I'm going to feel really anxious or, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what the consequences are, but I believe there is some consequence anywhere from anxiety to something worse. Um, and so you don't have to rhyme. Um, and, and, the, and the trick of exposure, you know, that, that we might have trouble with is, you know, we'd have to find out is a rhyming mental or out loud and how automatic it is and you know what ways we could do to interfere with it. You know, what are the rules of rhyming? Are you able to just do a single rhyme or if the rhyme doesn't feel just right? Do you keep rhyming? You, you must do it at a high enough rate that it's, you know, somewhat aggravating. But so we have a lot of questions about the nature of it in terms of how we would set up exposures to it. But, you know, and, and maybe you meant that when you're doing something important, your urge to rhyme gets really powerful. And, you know, again, the question is that because that's going to make the thing of value work better or not work. Or I need to know all those things. <laughs> um, but if you're asking. You don't have to rhyme. Yeah. If you're asking Terracotta Ciabatta, love that name. Uh, how can you mess it up? one of the things we love to prescribe is if you find yourself doing a compulsion, then you undo a compulsion and then you do whatever else you're going to do. So if you find yourself that you've rhymed before doing something that's really important to you, pause for a moment, say something that isn't rhyming and then do that thing. And that would be a great start to some ERP. And I might good. have you learn a speech or a passage out of a book by heart, not a poem or a song. And, uh, you know, it should be something that's long enough that we'd have you recite that while you're doing the important thing, because while you're reciting that you're not, you're not verbally rhyming out loud, you mm -hmm. know, maybe your head's also doing it in the background. And that, that, we might accept that. I think as Patrick is suggesting, we, we would, find, we would work with you to find ways to mess it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, Armin says. Am I at fault for OCD taking my time and doing nothing with my time? 
Also, what does OCD recovery look like? Well, let me start in the second one and I'll give John the first one. I can tell you OCD <laughs> recovery looks like, because this is fun. Uh, go back to my Monday uh, webinar that I did with Stacy Conroy, someone who talks about her life experience of substance use and obsessive compulsive disorder and PTSD, who now is a therapist and works for the VA. And though she has albinism and is legally blind, is one of the most frequent goers to amusement parks around the world and loves to travel with friends and, and sees, sees the world in her way and experiences in her way and loves every moment of it. So go back and watch Monday because we had a really significant talk about that. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's like periodically OCD will pop up, but not it doesn't have to pop up the way it does and not controlling your life every moment and being able to enjoy things. What's I, I you know, I, I like the way you structured who's going to answer what. Yeah, you pick no offense. You pick the easy one. What was that first one again? I, oh, well, I, I knew you would want to jump on the first one. So that's why I gave it to you. OK, <laughs> I admit it. Uh, is he at fault? For taking um, time and doing nothing. Is, am I at fault for OCD taking my time and doing nothing with my time? Well, you know, I, I would love to know, you know, when, when you say doing nothing with your time, are you doing nothing with your time because you're frozen in fear or frozen with avoidance, you know, and, and you're... Um, not 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 seeing somebody to get help with ERP to overcome that. So, you know, you're telling me that this is kind of a, a way of avoiding things because um, that just feels less painful than than living. Um, it's a very difficult choice, you know, to, to, to do things and be in pain versus not. But yeah, um, it's a decision to not to not do the hard thing. Um, if, you know, I, I would be urging you not to beat yourself up, but I'd also be urging you to be changing that decision. Um, if there's some other way that you're doing nothing, I, I would have to hear what that is. Um, I, I always have a rule about procrastinating. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I am a great procrastinator. Friend of OCD, the procrastination, actually. Yes. <laughs> but but I, have, I have a special rule for my procrastination. And my rule is that when I'm procrastinating, I do something that's fun. Because when I'm done wasting the time and feeling crushed by the pressure of what I now have to do, I at least want to have had fun during that period as opposed to I'm just doing something like I'm, I'm not doing the thing that would be useful for me to do, you know, like finishing writing the paper, but at least I was playing Baldur's Gate and having a great time. And uh, yes, I have to, there are consequences for that procrastination, but it was, at least there was a trade off for it. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to I'm just sitting there and it's like, I can't make myself right. Uh, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. I really don't want to do this. So I, I, I try to make my procrastination, um, you know, because a lot of people, it's like, well, I can't do something fun because I need to do this other thing. Well, I'm not doing the other thing anyway, so I might as well be terrible and have fun. And, you know, and then I'll, you know, eventually do it. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of game time that way. <laughs> I bet you do. It might be why I'm currently... Since August, I'm now up to uh, 460 hours on Baldur's Gate. <laughs> and it's still amazing, isn't it? Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I got, you know, I was in New Zealand for two weeks and did not bring my laptop because, you know, I thought I'd do wow. vacation. You and Kathleen just take a little vacay there? Yeah, but um, mm -hmm. the, I, I'm on my third playthrough. And when I came back, there were things in the game that I'd never seen before or things that I, I I didn't know they could turn out that way. So so we're not going into detail, that, you know, except for the few video gamers out there. It was like on a third playthrough to run into completely new things because I did things differently. That's fairly unusual. Great game. Yeah. Anyway. Great game. Mario says, hello from Lebanon. I stayed 1.4 uh, year, uh, years in my apartment hiding. 
from and getting COVID, but now I'm out, I'm traveling again. I'm going to the supermarket, but I can't stop washing and disinfecting my hands. It was a huge step to get out, but the progress stopped there because I can't continue doing ERP to get over my contamination. Any advice? Well, kind of goes back to what we talked about a little earlier about the can't versus won't experience there. And if you keep telling yourself you can't do it, that's exactly what's going to happen. You will not do it. Yeah. And, you know, it's painful to say I won't do it. It is. It's you know, tough. I, I, you know. Yeah. You know. You know. When I. You know. When per, you, there is a time a person can say can't to me, and I won't argue. Mm -hmm. If a person says to me, "I feel like I can't," there you go. I will agree because I. I believe people definitely are describing the feeling, but feeling like I can and can't are very different. So. You know, the, the truth is, again, if I hold a gun at you, I'm, I feel like maybe you'd let me blow a bullet in one foot, but I don't think you're letting me blow a bullet in the second foot. Um, yeah, it is a painful decision. And I don't know if this is fortunate or not. It's not illegal to be OCD. So it is true. And I think you tell people this. I tell people that going through treatment is as hard as having the rituals. I think they're both equally hard. And the only difference is one is an end of rituals and the other is endless rituals. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that people would like, but there's got to be an easier way because I can't do it this way. Maybe there's an easier way someday, but we don't know it now. Outside of, you know, medication might make it, won't make it easy. It might make it easier. So if the person is not on any meds, this guy, that could be a very helpful addition. But you're still stuck, you know, medication alone is good for like 25 to 50%, which leaves a lot of people with a lot of problems. So you're still stuck with Patrick and I. Yes. Even though someone said in here, John, you can't be that old that you've been married for 50 years. You look so young. Just know that. Hey, just and I'm just going to say, as long as you bring it up, yesterday, mm -hmm. what's the, it's today Wednesday. Sorry, Monday uh, was the day I became officially 72. Congratulations! Now you must take Social Security. <laughs> it's required. <laughs> it's mandatory at 72. Right? Yeah. yeah so, mm -hmm. how's the Medicare working out? There? 65 is the killer when they say you're on Medicare, whether you like it or not. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How do you like that Medicare? Is it working for you? Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm alive still, so you know, so far so good. There you go. Good. Uh, we're at about our last minute here, John. Any uh, parting words that you would like to give to the crowd before we go? No, I, I you know, I'm, I, as always, I hope. Uh, I hope some of what we said touched you in a way that that's going to be useful and um, allows you to be understanding towards yourself, but also is a little bit inspiring to do this really painful thing, you know, because it's, um, it is really hard work, you know, and, and I mean, part of the self-compassion is like, except, you know, it's like, this is hard, you know, I, I, that it should, there's no idea it should be easy. It's not, but the alternative sucks it gives it, you know, sometimes people say it's too hard and it's like well you know you're kind of acting like i can do my ritual you know i can do this really horrible treatment and go back to my wonderful easy life yeah uh, where we're talking about again an end of rituals ultimately or endless rituals mm -hmm. you've already done an incredible experiment of the ritual method I feel like the data is so, you know, I feel like your data shows like, yeah, this doesn't work. Right. How many more years of running this experiment do you need? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. A reminder to everyone tonight brought to you by NoCD, an online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. If you're looking for treatment for OCD, BFRBs, tics, hoarding, check us out at NoCD.com. We work here in the U.S. and Canada and Australia and the U.K. as well. And we do take insurance, too, here in the U.S. Always a pleasure to have our monthly friend, John Grayson, with us. Next month, we're going to be off a little bit because we have conferences and travel and thing, I think, coming up. So we'll, we'll figure out a date. We'll let everybody know exactly what that is. But uh, John,
Jot, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks and look forward to seeing you in person as well. Too. I know. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.